Good morning, my name is Cynthia Magro. I'm going to be reviewing with you our paper, which is in press now with the Annals of Diagnostic Pathology entitled, Severe COVID-19, a Multifaceted Viral Vasculopathy Syndrome. The objective of this study is um, really to further elucidate the pathophysiology that underlies severe COVID-19 as a follow-up to our original translational research paper that was published in April of this year. By assessing the in situ detection of infectious SARS-CoV-2 and viral membrane proteins, including spike, SARS-CoV-2 membrane and envelope, and the ACE2 distribution of various organs, and the host response is both innate and adaptive. In 26 patients represented by 12 autopsies, 13 pre-mortem skin samples, two below the knee amputation specimens, and one open lung biopsy. What were the baseline discoveries? I'm going to highlight them now and then illustrate them. Number one, infectious virus, as determined by an RT and situ PCR technique for SARS-CoV-2, was largely limited to ACE2 positive endothelial cells of the septal microvasculature of the lung and alveolar macrophages. Number two, viral spike protein and other capsid proteins without viral RNA, so really pseudovariants, if you will, were localized to ACE2 positive endothelial cells in extrapulmonary microvessels, the greatest extent of ACE2 expression, and therefore of the SARS-CoV-2 protein localization was the brain and skin microvasculature. The ACE2 positive microvessels with SARS-CoV-2 protein showed evidence of complement activation and microvascular injury. Although both infectious virus in the lung and the docked viral spike protein was associated with complement activation, only the endocytosed pseudovariants outside the lung in the endothelium induced a marked upregulation of the various cytokines that have been noted to be elevated in patients with severe COVID-19, namely interleukin-16 and alpha IL-1 beta and IL-8. This is a collage of the classic septal microangiopathy that defines the basis of the acute respiratory distress syndrome in patients with severe COVID-19. You can see that the septal microvasculature are very injured. This is a necrotic septa with fibrin deposition in the wall and in the lumens. In this septal microvessel, one can, septa, one can see capillaries that are dilated, that are disrupted with endothelial cell necrosis and detachment leading to some capillaries that are devoid of endothelium, all very typical for a complement needed vascular injury pattern as we uh, demonstrated in our earlier translational research paper. And as you know, when you slough endothelium and expose the type for collagen of the septal capillary basement membranes out, that will trigger coagulation pathway activation and thrombosis. And so another aspect of the septal microangiopathy is one of frank vascular thrombosis. And you can see obviously how the diseased septal capillaries would be ineffectual for the exchange of oxygen uh, and therefore lead to this dead space ventilation hypoxemic respiratory failure. Over and above the posse inflammatory capillary injury pattern, there was evidence of a procoagulant state uh, and therefore it was not uncommon to see larger vessel thrombosis as one sees in this artery uh, amidst the uh, diseased lung parenchyma. The microvascular thrombosis also prevailed in other organ systems. We know that uh, patients with severe COVID-19 develop a distinct type of skin rash um, that is a neck-like perperic rash called thrombotic retiform perpura. Here we see a patient with classic acrothrombotic retiform perpura. The skin biopsy once again showed findings that are typical for a complement mediated vascular injury syndrome, uh, being that of a posse inflammatory thrombogenic vasculopathy associated with 
uh, extensive deposits of the membranolytic attack complex C5B-9. Patients with severe COVID-19 have evidence of systemic complement activation, a finding we um, presented in our earlier translational research paper. And therefore, when you do a skin biopsy of normal deltoid skin, one will see prominent deposits of C3D, C4D, C5B-9, all components of complement activation within the microvessels of normal skin. And so this patient with severe COVID-19 uh, had a normal deltoid skin biopsy showing prominent deposits of uh, complement within the microvessels. <clears throat> what about the pathology outside the lung and outside the skin? Well, essentially, it was characterized by posse inflammatory focal microvascular injury present in other organ systems, including the skin, brain, <clears throat> kidney, liver, and heart. Uh, here we see kidney and liver showing microvessels with thrombosis, very similar to the type of positive inflammatory thrombotic diathesis we see in the skin. Um, in the brain, one also will see a pattern typical for complement mediated injury, which is in the context of capillaries, and is right in the capillary, devoid of endothelium. With C5B-9 drills a hole into the endothelial cell, the endothelial cell will die and it's sloughed off, leaving a um, blood vessel stripped of its endothelial lining as evidenced in these two microvessels of the brain. In addition, there, is, there was evidence of posse inflammatory larger vessel thrombosis that is reflective of the underlying procoagulant state that these patients have. And of course, the, there will be pathologic changes related to ischemic injury, but no primary inflammation. And very importantly, uh, no viral cytopathic changes as one might encounter in other viral syndromes like measles or cytomegalovirus infection, etc. Not surprisingly, complement deposition was noted in most organs to some degree, being greatest in the lung, skin, brain, kidney, and heart, reflective of the fact that patients with severe COVID-19 have systemic complement activation. And here we have C5B-9 in microvessels in the heart, brain, outlining the septal capillaries, and in the liver. Well, what is the distribution of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA, which would indicate active viral replication? The infected cells, according to our studies, were primarily within the lung, specifically the septa microvasculature. Here we have a septa, an alveolar space, and you can see how the septal capillaries are extensively highlighted uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 RNA, indicative of uh, active viral replication, and as well, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA was found within the alveolar um, macrophages. But significant bar replication did not occur outside the lung and nasopharynx, with the exception of the occasional cell uh, within the liver, probably of monocytic uh, derivation. In contrast, the SARS-CoV-2 protein, and by that I mean the uh, surface protein, the, the actual uh, capsid protein, either in the context of spike like a protein, um, the envelope protein, or the membrane protein, that did localize to the endothelium in the absence of active viral replication in the skin and brain, and to a lesser extent in the heart, liver, and kidney, really defining the concept of pseudovarions or uh, non-infectious viral particles. And here we have thrombotic reticulum purpura showing a very um, striking pattern of SARS-CoV-2 membrane expression in the endothelium. Um, as I was mentioning, we didn't just confine our um, SARS-CoV-2 membrane protein assessment to one uh, particular component of the capsid, but we looked at membrane envelope and glycoprotein 
Um, and here we have envelope SARS-CoV-2 in the endothelium of a deltoid skin microvessel. Um, here's another deltoid skin microvessel with SARS-CoV-2 membrane and another uh, relatively unremarkable microvessel showing the docked spike glycoprotein. During the session, the head of our uh, electron microscopy has spent an extensive amount of time studying the ultrastructure of SARS-CoV-2, and her discoveries more or less mirror um, what we found as far as evidence of active viral replication using our RT and situ PCR technique. Basically, she discovered intact virions in the lung septal capillary endothelium but was not able to unequivocally document intact virions in the endothelium uh, outside the lung in other organ systems. And I just wanted to um, highlight what the ultrastructure of the SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. So here we have a cross-section of the virus. You can see the spike glycoproteins emanating from the surface, um, similar to the spike like proteins that are emanating from the head of the Conrad the COVID, and he's right next door to his landlord, Bruce the Bat there. Um, and you can see the interior has a somewhat granular appearance, and that reflects the nucleic capsid intimately admixed with the RNA. And very importantly, the virus gains entry into the cell through ACE2, uh, and then becomes incorporated into the cytoplasm through endocytosis, which means that these viral particles have to be membrane bound. In contrast, when we looked at the endothelial cells of the skin that had the docked protein, we did, did see these structures that sort of resemble the SARS-CoV-2 virion, but there's no internal granularity. In other words, there's no evidence of a nuclear capsid, number one. And number two, these particles are not bound by a membrane. So these are not true virions. They are probably uh, something referred to as clathrin coated vesicles, which form after endocytosis. And whether or not they represent the endocytosed pseudovirions is unclear, but what is clear is that they do not represent viral particles, uh, or virions rather, and should not be interpreted as uh, virions. A very important aspect of this study was to determine the ACE2 distribution within the microvessels of the um, body. Uh, since there was this docked uh, protein outside the lung and evidence of the intact virus within the septal capillaries, one would have to assume that these microvessels in the lung and outside the lung must express the receptor for the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein, -like which could be either in the context of an intact virus or the spike glycoprotein -like as a pseudovirion. And we examined, therefore, ACE2 distribution, and we found that indeed the microvessels uh, could express ACE2. And so here we have a microvessel of the skin whereby the ACE2 is highlighted with a red chromogen, while the SARS-CoV-2 membrane is highlighted with a brown chromogen referred to as a diamine of benzidine. And basically using this um, nuance uh, software technique, it will take the chromogen stain and convert it into a fluorescent signal. So the red chromogen of the ACE2 is converted into a red signal, and you can see how it uh, is uh, highlighting the endothelium of the microvessel. While the diamine of benzidine um, stain, which will be for the SARS-CoV membrane, is converted using this software technique into a green signal. And then when we merge those two signals, green and red, we end up with a co-localized yellow signal, which clearly indicates that the ACE2 expressing endothelium um, was co-localizing with the SARS-CoV-2 membrane as one of the capsid proteins um, that we studied that appear to be traveling, shall we say, uh, as, a, as a unit, basically. A unit devoid, however, of the actual RNA and nucleic capsid, and hence not really a true infectious uh, particle.
extra pulmonary microvassal, microvascular um, SARS-CoV-2 protein without viral replication more or less mirrored the ACE2 distribution. So the deeper dermis and fat and the brain show the greatest extent of vascular viral protein, ACE2, complex activation, and also was the source of the hypersatic anemia we see in severe COVID. The endothelial cells that express the ACE2 and the protein with the complement activation also expressed IL-6 and other related cytokines. And if one had to rank the microvascular ACE2, the highest level of ACE2 expression from a microvascular perspective was found in the skin, the brain, and the liver, while the expression was significantly less in the placenta, kidney, and heart, and there was an absent signal present in the spleen, the lymph node, the prostate, ovary, bone marrow, and esophagus. And that's not to say that in these other organ systems you cannot see pathology. In fact, you can see pathology. You can see infarcts because of larger vessel thrombosis reflective of the underlying procoagulant state. What was particularly fascinating in the skin was the relative distribution of ACE2 within the microvessels. It was a gradation pattern whereby superficially within the dermis, there was very little ACE2 expression in the microvessels in contradistinction to its expression at higher levels in the fat and in the deeper dermis. An important question is, why is it that the patients with severe COVID-19 um, have such high levels of active viral replication in the septal microvasculature of the lung, which is the pre presumptive source of all the docked protein that then uh, disseminate uh, into the various extrapulmonary ACE2 microvascular beds. And I think this study that we just published in the British Journal of Dermatology does shed some light uh, in answering that question. There are two radically different forms of cutaneous COVID-19 that affect acral sites, and by that I mean you know, hands and feet. One is the so-called COVID toes or COVID perniosis that we see in young children and young adults who are uh, mildly symptomatic or even asymptomatic, and they develop these very robust lymphocytic uh, infiltrates in their um, toes called COVID toes, and it looks very much like idiopathic perniosis, which is established to be a, uh, an interferonopathy, where these patients have a mutation in T-Rex1 leading to excessive interferon signaling in their skin. It looks identical to so-called idiopathic perniosis. And that is in contradistinction to another acral COVID-19 skin eruption, which I've already mentioned a few times, which is the thrombotic retiform purpura of severe COVID-19. So here we have the COVID toes in panel A, we have idiopathic hernio in panel B, and we have the thrombotic retiform purpura of severe COVID-19 in panel C. This collage is a very nice depiction of the differing pathologies and hence pathophysiologies that underlie these two disparate forms of acral COVID-19. In the COVID toes or COVID perniosis, we have a robust lymphocytic infiltrate and many monocytes surrounding and permeating blood vessels throughout the dermis resulting in the COVID toes clinically. There is evidence of a very strong type 1 interferon signature in these skin biopsies as revealed by the striking degree of myxovirus resistance protein staining. Myxovirus resistance or MXA is the surrogate type 1 interferon marker that we use on paraffin embedded tissue. And it had a pattern that was virtually identical to classic perniosis, which is an established form of uh, interferonopathy. And that was in contradistinction to severe COVID-19, where there was no inflammation, everything looks pink, there's no blue, and the blood vessels have endothelial cell injury, vascular thrombosis, and here the interferon signaling is absent. Well, what is interferon? Well, interferon, as is suggested by the name, interferes with viral replication and also enhances the innate and adaptive immune response. It is a very important cytokine that uh, is needed to fight off viral infections. 
and we can see that the patients with severe COVID have a very blunted interferon response, which would be conducive to high levels of viral replication in contradistinction to the COVID toes where they have a strong antiviral response that leads to mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic disease because that virus doesn't replicate in the lung and cause the havoc that uh, is seen in severe COVID-19. So here we have again our ultrastructural depiction of the uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, here's more of a cartoon-like depiction up there with uh, Conrad the COVID. Um, and we have the uh, fact that the intact virus is replicating in the septal microvasculature. The virus eventually dies and those pseudovirions dock to the ACE2 positive vessels. We know that the spike-glycoprotein, protein, whether it's an intact virus or a pseudovirion, will have sites that will interact with mannan binding lectin, activate the mannan binding lectin pathway, and generate C5B-9, which drills a hole in the endothelial cell, damages the endothelial cell, leading to vascular thrombosis. And uh, that is what is happening in those ACE2 micro vessels found in the skin, fat, and other organ systems. And it's important to remember that these ACE2 positive vessels with the docked protein could serve as a fuel for distant vascular injury and thrombosis because of the crosstalk between the complement pathways, of which there are three, the classic, the mannan binding lectin, and the alternative pathway, and the coagulation cascade. And not only that, knowing that the highest level of ACE2 positive expression in microvessels is in the fat, it also provides a pathophysiologic construct for why obesity is linked with severe COVID-19. Um, and this is a diagram from our original translational research paper where we see the spike like a protein either in the context of intact virus, as we see it in the septal microvasculature of the lung, or a pseudovirion interacting with mannan binding lectin, generating C5B-9, which damages the endothelium, leads to thrombosis. Also, when we have activation of this pathway, we can activate the alternative pathway, we can activate the coagulation pathway because of the crosstalk. When we have endocytosis of the spike like a protein, into the cell or the entire virus into the cell, it will grab with it the ACE2 receptor that it bound to, and that means that there is less ACE2 available to allow that critical conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 1-9 and then 1-7, which is very much protective of the endothelium. And, in, and in, instead, what happens without the ACE2, you have high levels of angiotensin 2, and that will contribute further to the catastrophic endothelial cell injury that underlies severe COVID-19. And this collage simply emphasizes the whole concept of the um, ACE2 positive vessel having the docked pseudovirion, the spike like a protein, and other related capsid proteins um, with resultant man and binding leptin activation. Uh, and here we see the um, co-localization of the C4D and spike like a protein in the microvessels of the skin, as I've shown you in other images. And the end result is complement mediated vascular injury, resulting in endothelial cell injury, uh, sloughing of the endothelium, um, resulting in uh, endothelial microvessels that are devoid of endothelium with thrombosis. And here we have the brain showing these very acellular appearing microvessels with no endothelium uh, as the endothelium has been damaged by C5B-9. And this particular image shows the evidence of vascular compromise being the red cell extravasation and the pigment uh, in macrophages being hemocytorin deposition in macrophages. And this emphasizes that when you activate the mannan binding lectin pathway, you generate factors that activate the clotting pathway. Once you activate the clotting pathway, you generate factors that will activate the complement pathways. And when you activate the mannan binding lectin pathway, 
it also leads to activation of the alternative pathway. So the end result of these uh, pathway activations is that they basically synergize and uh, interplay and activate uh, each other, so to speak. As I was mentioning, another critical aspect of COVID, severe COVID-19 is hypercytokinemia. And what we found is that the um, cytokines that are upregulated in severe COVID, namely IL-6, IL-8, tnf alpha interleukin-1, um, they are found within the ACE2 positive microvessels that exhibit the docked protein um, without viral replication. Paradoxically, we did not see that pattern of cytokine expression in the endothelium in the septal uh, microvasculature. And what is the basis and how, how, how does that link with the um, mannan binding lectin activation? Well, it actually does. The mannan binding lectin pathway not only activates the complement pathway, but also by upregulating P38 and nuclear factor kappa beta will lead to enhanced um, cytokine expression. So the mannan binding lectin activation results in both complement mediated vascular injury, but also enhanced cytokine expression in the endothelium. And that too contributes to the vascular thrombosis since high levels of IL-6 from endothelium has been uh, shown to be an aggregator of platelets. And this is a collage of um, uh, the brain uh, showing the classic pathophysiologic construct for what we see um, when you dock these pseudovirions into ACE2 positive vessels, which we know exist in the brain. Uh, and in fact, patients with severe COVID-19 frequently do have encephalopathic uh, symptoms. Here we have the brain vessels are ACE2 positive. Not surprisingly, you're gonna have some spike glycoprotein and other capsid proteins localized to these vessels, which we know will activate the mannan binding lectin pathway, leading to the uh, complement uh, deposition in the microvessels, and at the same time, resulting in enhancement of select endothelial-based uh, cytokines like TNF-alpha and uh, IL-6, uh, et cetera. So in conclusion, with a blunted type of interferon response, SARS-CoV-2, the endotheliotropic, replicates excessively in the lung microvasculature, although not elsewhere, apart from the nasopharynx and liver. Microvascular complement activation by spike glycoprotein and mannabinding lectin engagement results in septal capillary injury. The SARS-CoV-2 pseudovarions released from dead virus in the septal capillaries disseminate systemically and localize to select ACE2 positive vessels and results in mannabinding lectin mediated complement activation and endothelial-based cytokine expression resulting in vascular injury and thrombosis and hypersetic anemia. Complement activation amplifies the alternative pathway and activates the coagulation pathway leading to distant microvascular injury and thrombosis. Enhanced expression of IL-6 and other cytokines from the endothelium likely contributes to the procoagulant state. And the end result, therefore, is microangiopathic acute respiratory distress syndrome and significant multi-organ microvascular injury and a procoagulant state that underlies and really defines severe COVID-19. We certainly know that there are risk factors like poor type 1 interferon signaling, which in fact has been linked with obesity, um, diabetes mellitus. Well, we know in diabetes, these patients have glycosylation of the regulatory molecule for C5B-9 called CD59, and obesity. And uh, we've already discussed why uh, obesity may be a risk factor in terms of the ACE2 microvessels serving as a potential fuel for the um, alternative pathway and coagulation pathway activation. Thank you very much.